GE salmon is the first animal ever anywhere in the world to be approved for a human conception, the first genetically engineered animal. The only place that it is currently being produced and consumed is Canada, but that is about to change because last month, the US Food and Drug Administration, or the FDA, greenlighted GE salmon for production for the first time in the US. And in fact, there's a factory that's been approved in Indiana and it very well is producing salmon starting this week. So this event has ended up being extremely timely. The biotech company Aqua Bounty first started development of GE salmon in 1989. Genetic engineers are currently experimenting on dozens of animals, including chicken, cattle, and pigs, and fish, including trout, catfish, tilapia, striped bass, flounder, and salmon. They claim that they will grow faster, have greater muscles, and that they'll be disease resistant. Aqua Bounty claims GE salmon is more sustainable and better for the environment. On the sustainable page of their website, they tout the benefits of low impact fish farming and reducing carbon emissions by farming salmon closer to consumers and therefore cutting down on travel. For this reason, they argue that farmed fish is the future. Civil society has organized to counter GE salmon from the beginning. So CAGJ, my organization, got involved in 2015 when Friends of the Earth reached out to us um, to engage us in pressuring Costco, which is headquartered here in Seattle, to join 80 other retailers who had pledged to not sell GE salmon if it were to be approved by the FDA. So we held, held several demonstrations that garnered a lot of media attention, which was great. So this is one of our actions um, at Costco in South Seattle. Beautiful pictures by Alex Garland. Um, the day after the FDA first approved it, in 2015, Costco finally made a statement that they do not intend to purchase GE salmon. And it still is on their sustainable fisheries website. If you see at the bottom, it says Costco does not intend to sell genetically modified salmon. So we won a big victory, which was great. <laughs> so CAGJ was thinking of moving on to other solidarity campaigns with local food producers, but then we learned that a resolution had been passed by the National Congress of American Indians opposing GE salmon. And the resolution was initiated by Valerie Seagrest, who's with us here tonight. We had collaborated with Valerie on our book, um, and it was her passion about this issue that inspired C CAGJ to continue working to oppose GE salmon, and specifically by amplifying the opposition of Northwest tribes um, to oppo in opposing GE salmon and protecting wild salmon. Um, it was also Valerie that suggested that we produce a film in order to raise awareness, because um, we found that even though this is been in the works for literally decades um, and has been approved now for several years. It just seems not many people have heard of GE Salmon. So we're really excited to scream the film now. Um, the film was co-produced by CAGJ, the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, and New Canoe Media. And I just want to acknowledge and thank Katie Jennings, the filmmaker who is here with us tonight. Where are you, Katie? Thank you. <laughs> We also want to thank Muckleshoot Tribe Charity Fund for funding the production of the film. So please enjoy. It's a little under... <laughs> enjoy the film. It's just a little under four minutes. We are the Coast Salish people, the salmon people. For thousands of years, we have organized our lives around salmon. Archaeologists can date it back to at least 10,000 years. And if you ask any Muckleshoot person or Coast Salish person, they would say it's since time began. Salmon is the pillar of our culture. And we took care of that species just as it has taken care of us and upheld our health. And now it needs our help more than ever. A Boston-based techno corporation is genetically modifying salmon eggs on Prince Edward Island in Canada. It's taking genes from three different fish and creating an unnatural species with three sets of DNA, which they then fly to Panama, where it's raised in crowded cement pens. This creature grows two to three times faster than normal. It's aggressive. It feeds ravenously. Its flesh has less protein, less healthy fats, fewer vitamins and healthy acids than wild salmon. 
It's recently become the first genetically modified animal cleared for food use in the United States. The Quinault Nation opposes genetically engineered salmon because we believe very strongly that the salmon were gifted to our ancestors from the Creator. And when the Creator made and designed salmon, it was perfect. And for man to think that they could somehow modify it and make it better is, is very arrogant. It's not right. Nothing we can do as human beings can restore a wild stock once it's gone. So if we can't live with worst case scenario, what are we doing even thinking about going there? My name is Louis Ungaro. I'm a Muckleshoot tribal member. I've been a lifelong fisherman my whole entire life. Fishing has been something that has really formed me into who I am. It's taught me how to live. Um, it's taught me how to adapt. It's given me strength. At one time, there was 100% of habitat around here, and you can look behind me and see your precious habitat where our babies are trying to navigate and to get out to make their cycle and come back home to their ancestral rivers. I think that you have to go back and you have to do your work with habitat. Oh, these things that we have out here are gifts from God. They're gifts, and you need to take care of them. And if you don't take care of them, they'll be taken from you. We're going to have an opportunity to build that solid foundation for future generations to build, because ultimately, we are the Salmon people. We are the Coast Salish people, the Salmon people. We are Coast Salish people, we are Salmon people, and this is our cause. So before I introduce our panelists, I want to acknowledge that I believe the staff from both of our Washington State Senators are here with us tonight. Louise O'Rourke, um, the King County Outreach Director for Senator Maria Cantwell, thank you so much for coming. And Kate Baumgartner, with this, who is the Seattle Outreach Director for Senator Patty Murray. Hi. So after the panel, as we said, we'll have time for, for questions and answers. Um, but right now I'm going to introduce our speakers and I'll just ask that you come up maybe as I, or why don't you just come up now. So Valerie Segrest, I like to say, is a food sovereigntist. <laughs> She's a native nutrition educator who specializes in local and traditional foods. As an enrolled member of the Muckleshoot Indian tribe, Valerie serves her community as the coordinator of the Muckleshoot Food Sovereignty Project, and she also works as the executive director of Feed Seven Generations, a native-led nonprofit aiming to strengthen food sovereignty in Indian country. She's also, in addition to all of that, working towards a PhD in the built environment at the University of Washington. Fawn Sharp is an attorney currently serving her fourth term as president of the Quinault Indian Nation. President Sharp has held many leadership positions, more numerous than I could name, including um, President of the Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians and Vice President of the National Congress of American Indians. She received her law degree from University of Washington in 1995. Was that a note for me? Okay. Um, I want to congratulate Alan Stay on his recent retirement after a legal career spanning many decades during which he litigated many important cases. In the 70s, Alan was co-lead counsel in the first attempt by tribes to assert a treaty right to protect the fish habitat. Most recently, Alan worked with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribes Office of the Tribal Attorney where he was co-counsel in the litigation of the Culvert case, asserting the treaty right to habitat protection. Alan attended the University of Washington as well, receiving his law degree in 1971. Um, there's a change in our program tonight. Um, we had hoped that George Kimbrell would join us, who is co-lead counsel on the lawsuit brought against the FDA. However, he had a scheduling conflict, and we are incredibly grateful to Dana Pearls for agreeing to fly in from California on very short notice. 
Dana Pearls is a senior food and agriculture campaigner with Friends of the Earth and leads the food and agriculture team's international and national regulatory and market campaigns on biotechnology and genetic engineering. Prior to joining Friends of the Earth, she was a Northern California community organizer with Pesticide Watch, where she led regional campaigns on pesticides used in agriculture. Dana holds a master in, master's in city planning from UC Berkeley in California. Please join me in welcoming our panel. And Valerie will speak first. Good evening. It's such an honor to be here, and I really am, um, I'm just excited to be here with all of you. Um, it really is an honor, and I appreciate your ear and your attention to this, this um, important cause. I've been asked to sort of talk about why this is, you know, really important. Um, and in my background as a foods educator, uh, when we talk about salmon, we regard it as the most honored traditional food in our territory. Um, and that, and for those of you who know me, that means a lot because I'm really a plant person. <laughs> and I could, I could go on and on about how huckleberries could also be really honored and, and stinging nettle and things like that. So, um, but for thousands of years, you know, the Chinook, the dog, the sockeye, the coho, the pink have held their rightful place as cultural keystone pillars of Northwest coastal native people. And archeologists date this use back to 10,000 years, but if you talk to any Coast Salish person, we'll tell you that this has been happening since time began. Uh, this is reaffirmed in our creation stories, which emphasize salmon as the first food to be given to the people. It has remained one of the most important staple foods to this day. For the Coast Salish people, the salmon are more than just food. They are our greatest teachers. We learn from them in many ways, and it is through observation that we find their ceremonious return to their ancestral rivers as an act of love and generosity. In many ways, it's the salmon's world, and we just live in it. During this annual spawning, where the salmon people give their life to enrich the streams and soils of our food shed, it is their commitment to such a charitable act that presses us to ask ourselves how we, too, can be generous and fierce advocates for our environment. This is how we are reminded of the important teaching of generosity in the Coast Salish culture. In order to honor the salmon for being such a powerful teacher, ceremonies are held annually with reverence. Salish elders often say that wealth is having access to native foods like salmon and also the knowledge of how to fish, prepare, and preserve them. The values and cultural traditions around salmon that are shared today are as applicable as they were generations ago. So about 20 years ago, genetically modified foods quietly entered our standard American food system. It showed up in grocery stores in the 90s, tomatoes and corn, which ironically were both sacred foods of first peoples of this country. Uh, despite the predictability or predictable, irreversible, disruptive food system damage uh, and lack of research on potential poor health outcomes, it still reached our shelves. And the foods that we, these foods that we eat and us eating them is the research. We are the experiment. Uh, that is, you know, has only, and it has recently only showed up as a plant species, and so this is really the first animal species to hit our food system. Aquabounty is a transnational corporation and has already patented a variety of salmon that are infused with the DNA of a wild Chinook salmon and a poutfish which is an eel-like fish. And in order to fuse these DNA molecules together, they had to infect cells from the Chinook and the pout with viruses and proteins and fuse them into an Atlantic salmon. This salmon is said to grow to full size in half the time a wild fish would. And in addition to shorter production cycles, it is also supposed to increase efficiency in production. So what are the most alarming issues? raised by what have some, some have properly coined as the frankenfish, 
The first one, this has never been done before, like we keep saying, remember this will be the first GE animal species to be integrated into our food system. The second, no research has been done on the consequences of human consumption as well as the irreversible environmental impacts. Three, this is extremely detrimental to our fishing economy. So the effects of this rest on the shoulders of our commercial and tribal fishermen who will suffer the consequences of a GE salmon driving down the cost of wild salmon. Um, they're also not nutritious. So genetically modified salmon, I'm a nutritionist, so I have to say this, right? <laughs> genetically modified salmon also wouldn't provide the health benefits that naturally evolved salmon do. Uh, these fish have less of the healthy proteins and fats that our wild salmon are famous for. In fact, it's about 33% less fat, and the fat that it does contain is high in contaminants, um, pesticides, antibiotics, and pollutants. Um, they have cancer and health hazards. So this protein that's really high in this fish has something in it called, uh, for those of you geeks out there like me, insulin growth factor one, which uh, is directly connected with cancers, specifically breast, colon, and um, prostate cancer. Wild salmon, this is the most alarming for me, truly, that it has become property. That um, because this fish carries a patented gene, this means that a company officially owns it. And if the fish were to ever, in whatever context, escape in the wild and breed with a hatchery fish, which is pretty much all we're getting right now, um, we would end up answering to a corporation. So, you know, many countries employ what is called the precautionary principle. Uh, and this simply means that when uncertainty is likely to persist, it is our human duty to emphasize the need for research that contributes to strength of the evidence of plausible health effects. And we simply do not know enough about genetically engineered salmon to introduce it into our food system. Operating by any other way puts humans, the environment, many species, and several economies at very high risk. It especially puts tribal communities at risk. We are a fishing culture and our keystone species since time immemorial has been the salmon. We organize our lives around salmon. Our ancestral wisdom tells us that when the salmon are gone, everything else will disappear. We understand that the salmon return to the rivers to feed the waters, the land, the trees, the plants, the animals, and finally, us pitiful humans. <laughs> so what happens when GE salmon escapes and interbreeds with our ancestral salmon? As native people, we operate by the laws and the wisdom of nature, and the combination of genes and viruses and eel-like fish would never occur naturally. Are we really going to allow an immature science to replace the work and, of an innate wisdom of nature? Prohibiting GE salmon from entering our food system is a moral obligation to the region's original residents, but also for those who occupy my ancestral lands. Restoring what has been lost of our salmon habitat is an important collaboration between tribes, environmental scientists, activists, and local governments that has gone on for decades. It has come with a sizable monetary investment from every tribe to restore salmon habitat. We can't simply stand by and watch as wild salmon, which are on a trajectory of extinction, and with all of our scientific brilliance, choose to allow this to happen. Instead, we can choose our brilliance to focus on engineering waterways or redesigning man-made redesigning man-made barriers and really make a difference for the future of such an iconic species of our region salmon is a fundamental treasure of this place it is the food that feeds our spiritual and cultural identity salmon represents our ancestral economies and the continued existence of the salmon people is inextricably intertwined with the health of the land and all that dwells on it the poor implementation of scientific and engineering methods in the past are what has directly contributed to why our salmon people are unable to spawn in the rising temperatures of our dammed rivers. This would be yet another example of the poor use of science and engineering. Don't let this happen, and remember that despite all of this, Native people continue to be relentless advocates for the continuity of our precious teachers. We are, after all, the students of the salmon people. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, I'm proud and pleased to be here tonight. I'm not a Native American. I'm a lawyer. Uh, to learn, and that's, that's sort of derogatory, I know, but uh, to know about what this issue is to Indian people, you listen to President Sharp and to Ms. Seacrest, they're the ones that have to live it every day. They're the ones that have to feel it. Uh, I've been involved in the struggle, but only as a laboring or not as a person who is doing the laboring. I can't tell you about genetically modified salmon because I don't know anything about it. But I can tell you about the struggle that tribes have had over the years to try to protect their resource, their way of life, and their culture and their religion. And what I'd like to do today, uh, if I might, is to talk about that so that uh, I might put some of their science and some of their heartfelt feelings into a more long-term legal perspective. I am still kind of employed by the Muckleshoot tribe, but I did retire after about 48 years. I've only represented Indian people. I've only represented Indian tribes, which makes me just a tad biased. But I hope you'll excuse that, and tonight I'll try not to let it show too much. Um, in the beginning, in 1854 and 1855, a little later than, than Val's beginning, um, the tribes had the exclusive right to use and occupy all the land that we're now on, all the resources they had a right to use. They had that right by uh, edict of the United States Supreme Court. But tribes were, were uh, not unmindful of what was happening to them. They looked out the window and all of a sudden the neighborhood was starting to deteriorate. Settlers were coming in, boats were coming in they didn't know about and what to do with these people coming into their neighborhood. Now, from the United States' point of view, they couldn't let those people in unless they had clear title to the land. So they needed the tribes to give up their land, to cede it. On the other hand, tribes knew that if they did not have a right to fish, hunt, and gather, uh, they would not be able to survive as a people. And that was central to their thought process in 1854 and 1855 when in this neck of the woods, six treaties were negotiated between the United States and tribes that are here. Key in those treaties were two things. One, from the United States' point of view, they got 64 million acres of land. Not a bad deal. The tribes reserved the right to hunt, fish, and gather as they had in the past, as they needed to into the future. That was the consideration they wanted from the treaty coupled with some small reservations that many of you may know who live in this area. Muckleshoot is just up toward Auburn. Quinault, which is one of the largest reservations on this side of the mountains, out toward the ocean. They would have a place to live, and they'd have a way to carry out their, their life if they had those treaties negotiated that way. I want to emphasize one point. This was a reserved right. That is, the right was not given to them by the United States in the treaties. It was theirs at the time, and they elected to keep it. It was theirs before, it is theirs at the time of the treaty, and it is theirs today. Um, it worked out pretty well for a while. The tribes were providing all the fish and game to the non-Indian settlers. They were helping them learn how to farm in a land that they had not known about. But it didn't take long before it became clear that there was tension between the tribes and the uh, settlers with respect to the ability to have that promise to have the right to fish forever would be met. What happened? Between about 19, 1890 and today, almost last year, eight times the United States Supreme Court had to deal with the fact the state and other non-Indian interests were doing what they could to limit or eliminate that promise which tribes made in 1854 in 1855. How did they do that? First of all, they said, well, you can't cross my land to get to your first fishing spot. Not too bad. The court said, no, that doesn't make any sense. Then they said, well, we'll put our fishing weir in front of your fish and take all the fish. The court said, no, nah, that doesn't look like it's, it's going to be supportive of the promise. Then the state said, well, we'll tax you. They could get a license. No, nope, the Supreme Court said that doesn't work. And then in the 60s, the Puyallup tribe courageously uh, had three United States Supreme Court cases where uh, they said, well, you can't discriminate against Indians. Now, you would think that in the 1960s, that would be a concept well understood in the world around us, but it took the United States Supreme Court to say, no, you can't discriminate against Indians. What they were doing was saying, you can't take steelhead. 
in a traditional way. Why? Because the steelhead was a very popular fish for non-Indian fishers. It wasn't their fault, that was just the way they were fishing. They were part of the fight. Uh, then uh, they decided that maybe they needed a share. Tribes weren't getting many fish. The, tribes, the United States Supreme Court said you get a share. At the time, the tribes were getting less than 2% of the harvest. Remember what they gave up, 64 million acres of land. They were taking 2% of the harvest. In 1970, it came to a head again in what you may know as the Bolt decision. The Bolt decision was an action by the United States against the state of Washington to try to once and for all resolve what that treaty right meant. The, United St the tribes, always mindful of being trusting to the United States, joined the case. They wanted to make sure they were there to make sure their interests were maintained. As I said, there was uh, only 2% of the fish being taken. Tribal people were being beat up. I don't, I don't want to go into this. That's old history. And, and, but it was tough. It was tough to be on the water. It was tough to be on the water. And we created several, many heroes at the time. Billy Frank, you may know that name. Stanley Moses, Esther Ross, Joe Delacruz, Guy McMines, and the two women on the, on the podium today part of that struggle to, to find out and what to do with that inability of tribes to take the fish. In 1970, the lawsuit was filed in 1974. It was resolved by uh, the district court here. And uh, what, what did that mean? Well, several things. You would think they're obvious. Access. Tribal people had access to the fish. Second, they couldn't be discriminated against. Well, we thought we learned that from the Supreme Court, but we learned it again. They had a right to manage their own fisheries. Tribes are governments. They're not clubs. They're not interesting sort of social groups. They are governments. They can put people in jail. They make taxes. They have rules and regulations. Um, they are in every sense of government, and they have a right to manage their own fisheries. They have a right to share up to 50% of the available fish. And the state has only limited abilities to interfere with the tribe's ability to harvest. So from 1855 until 2000 and, or 1974, that's how long it took to get that rule in place. But the state didn't quite think that was the right rule, and for the next eight years, they fought it. They fought it to the degree that the United States District Court removed from the state of Washington the power to regulate the state fisheries because the state said, we cannot obey federal law. So that was a, a, an unbelievable thing that the court did in those years. In 1979, the United States Supreme Court once again affirmed the right of tribes to take their fish. Incidentally, Slade Gorton, who was the Attorney General at that time, was asked by the Supreme Court about this being able to follow federal law, and he quite courageously said, nope, um, we can do that guys, and we won't do this again, and thus far they haven't. Uh, that came down in 1979, but the matter was not yet done. Uh, the tribes always believed that having a fishing right with no fish was no right at all. Valerie was talking about that today. What happens if the fish go away? What happens if there's, if there's no fish to harvest? So in 1970, tribes, not the United States, but tribes, added to the lawsuit and said the state could not kill fish that were necessary for maintaining the tribal right. And in 1970s, that was tried. And finally, in 2001, just yesterday in time, the tribes filed what was known as the Culvert case. The Culvert case was an action by the tribes to stop the state from taking uh, by killing salmon, by blocking the return of salmon from the ocean to the rivers. And why was Culvert suggested? We've, we heard, I'm, not a, I'm not a scientist, but scientists that we talked to said, the most important thing you can do to protect the salmon is make sure they can get from the ocean home. Get rid of the culverts, let them swim up the river, and they will in fact make it. That case was won just recently in the United States Supreme Court in an unusual verdict, 4-4, uh, when the court only had eight members on it. And so today, that is the law now. Uh, to its credit, the State Department of Natural Resources, the Parks Department, 
and the Fish and Wildlife have finished correcting all of their culverts. The Department of Transportation has until 2030 to do so. When that is done, and they cannot build any more bad ones. When that is done, hopefully, those fish will get home, producing more fish for everybody. So that's the story in five seconds of the troubles that were involving tribes and Indians in the state. Thank you very much. shorter than the previous person. Um, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Dana Pearls. I'm with Friends of the Earth. We're an environmental uh, NGO based in Washington, D.C. Um, and we are, um, I am deeply honored to be here tonight um, with my esteemed panelists and uh, members of a coalition that I've been working with around the topic of genetically engineered salmon. Um, so we are, uh, we have heard about an, a number of, of different interactions with the genetically engineered salmon from the cultural, um, the spiritual, the keystone of our food system, the legal aspects. Um, and we're really at a moment right now in history and time where, oh, this is for me. Um, where we are able to move, we can move towards a healthy ecosystem. Um, we can be listening to the people who have been taking care of our land for a long time. And we have an opportunity to move towards a healthy food system um, that supports the environment and that supports people. Um, but we have to fight right now against some new industrial pressures uh, to redesign nature and to consolidate our food system. Um, so there's another strategy that I'm going to talk about, and that is a market strategy. It's a market strategy that's important because it's an opportunity for all of us to be intervening. We can intervene at the market. The market is a place where we as individuals and collectively have power together. Um, so, as you heard, um, the FDA and the USDA is moving ahead with the genetically engineered salmon, despite the outcry and the uproar amongst people across this country. Um, the message, though, is clear that despite the fact that the FDA has, in fact, approved the GMO salmon, has lifted the uh, import ban, uh, people don't want GMO salmon. The polls are clear in Canada and the United States and around the world that people want to eat food which is ethical, which is sustainable, that is natural um, and, and healthy. And so this is an opportunity at the market level to work at both ends of the supply chain, working with fisher people and working with consumers together to meet in, to, in the middle and support the world and the food system that we actually want to see. So um, a bit of this, the GMO salmon timeline, um, it was developed for a long time. It was proposed in 2009 as a new animal drug. So this is an example of how the US government doesn't actually have a regulation that works for a genetically engineered animal, right? Our regulations are, are 30, 40, 50 years old. So the idea is that we would regulate, we are going to regulate the genetically engineered salmon in the same way that we would a chicken vaccine or an antibiotic used for a cow. So we're really trying to shoehorn in a new new technology into a very antiquated system. So 2009, it was proposed. It was approved in 2015. There was a ban put on it that was proposed and um, pushed through by Senator Mikowski from Alaska. Um, and then the USDA's genetically engineered labeling law um, went into effect in 2018, just at the end in, in December. And then the ban was just lifted in, in March, so just last month. Um, what this timeline doesn't show is that the people's voices has made it such that it's possible that the GMO salmon won't actually make it to market. We hope that it won't because people's voices have been the thing that have kept the GMO salmon from reaching the market thus. After the proposal in 2009, more than 200,000 public comments were submitted to the FDA against the approval of the GMO salmon. At the time, that was more than the FDA has ever seen on anything and that was a coalition 
of, um, of, of people. It was also the native tribes, it was NGOs, it was environmentalists, it was consumer groups. Um, it was a huge number of people. Before the GMO salmon was approved, um, already 78 different retailers totaling close to 16,000 stores had already said regardless of whether or not the FDA approves this GMO salmon, we will not sell it. And that wasn't because these retailers just woke up and said we want to do the right thing. It was because of people's voices. It was because people were contacting their stores and demanding. And so what, what this is is the GE Free Seed, GE free seafood campaign. Um, this is a coalition ex, um, effort by a, a number of amazing groups, including people in this room, on this panel, um, who have contacted all of these stores, who have launched campaigns on, at this point, 80 different retailers, including Walmart and Costco, Trader Joe's, um, Safeway, Albertsons, Whole Foods, the list goes on past where the screen is, um, to say, we don't want genetically engineered salmon. Don't be the GMO salmon store. Um, and, and to say that, that we have an obligation, we as, as people, have an obligation to move the market, to push against what we don't want, and to fight for what we do want. And, and companies are listening. Companies are listening to people say that they want what's sustainable, natural, and ethical. And so we launched a lot of campaigns on each of these stores, most recently Costco, um, there were people who went rogue and put signs right up next to the salmon sign inside the store. There were protests outside of the store. People wrote letters, made phone calls, um, sat in in the headquarters, endless meetings. Same with Kroger, same with Walmart. And at the end of the day, uh, all of the major retailers, the major grocery retailers have said, okay, we hear you, we, we are listening, and we will not be the GMO salmon store. Um, what this has done, which is really critical, is it's changed the narrative. The narrative has been with genetic engineered products, this is gonna save the world, we're gonna feed um, the growing population, this is going to be better than nature can do, and actually at the end of the day, we know that it's not. We have scientific evidence, we have about 30 years worth of evidence when it comes to genetically engineered plants, and as Valerie already said, there are a number of problems with the GMO salmon, not to mention that the studies that, were, that, that, the, that the company did were based on a sample size of six fish. I was taught in elementary school that was an insufficient number. Apparently, um, that's okay for the FDA. So this narrative that people don't want genetically engineered salmon is in the media now. There's a number of, of, of different um, conferences where they say, we have the answer. Aqua Bounty will say, we know what we need to do to feed the world if only we can convince people. We are the reason that this isn't being successful, and the reason is because we know that we want what's real, what's sustainable, what's natural, what's healthy for people, what's good for people and the environment. Um, so you see some of the, some of the headlines that have been populating that, this, that the rejection is real. Um, and, and one, one last thing that I do want to say um, around what's happening, what the political context is, is in December, there was this new, um, the National Bioengineered Food Disclosure Standard, and ultimately that was the USDA's version of a GMO labeling law. Um, However, there's a number of problems with it. It will cover GMO salmon. Um, however, the definitions under the USDA and the FDA are conflicting. The terms are very con uh, conflicting in that um, the GMO salmon and GMOs wouldn't have to say the words genetically engineered. Maybe they could say bioengineered, but actually what you could do is stick a QR code or stick a 1-800 number on the product. And that's up to the consumer, it's up to the shopper to then figure out how to scan that code if you have a phone that scans or make a telephone call for every single product that you're gonna buy. So this was really a success on the, on the side of the biotech industry to squash any sort of genetically engineered labeling. And this paved the way to the F for the F FDA to say, we don't need a ban anymore. We are going to label genetically engineered salmon using the term bioengineered, hidden behind a QR code or a 1-800 number, and that's sufficient for us. And so it was in that context that the FDA 
uh, made the argument that we don't need an import ban that will have labeling, when in fact it is quite a sham. It's irresponsible. It goes against the fact that more than 85 percent, this is an old poll, of people have said that GMOs should be labeled. And they should be labeled using terms that we all know, genetic engineering, GMOs. We have a right to choose. We have a right to choose the food that is natural, that is sustainable, um, that is responsible. And in this instance, we won't be able to tell if the salmon is farmed, if it's wild, if it's GMO. Um, and so I'll pause there and just to say though that we have an opportunity and a responsibility to decide on the future of food. We need to be putting systems in place that align consumers, producers, farmers, fishermen, and that push us towards a system which is responsible, one that is going to support food sovereignty. Um, and GMO salmon moves us in the opposite direction. And now we have an opportunity to weave together a food system between grassroots organizers, between fisher people, all the way up to the market. So I'll stop there and um, pass the mic to President Sharp. First of all, I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, those that are here tonight were called here. You're, you're here with purpose and, and with reason. And we firmly believe as Native people that those who are appointed and called at a special time and place are, are, are here with purpose. And so I want to acknowledge and recognize that. I also uh, thank the organizers for acknowledging and recognizing the indigenous peoples that have occupied these lands since time began. So I'm very honored. I'm very honored to serve uh, with this panel. I'm very honored to, uh, we had a council meeting late last night and I got up early this morning at 6 a.m. to attend a nine o'clock, a two o'clock, a three o'clock, and to be here, I'll get home at midnight. And so uh, that's the life of an elected official where we are dealing with many issues, but never for a second do I ever tire of the opportunity to directly engage with average citizens, people who share a deep passion for the issues that we work on and to join forces. I, I was asked to speak to the lawsuit itself and that's kind of a, uh, I have a couple of hats. I am a trained lawyer and so oftentimes I get asked to put that hat on. Uh, so in the absence of the attorney, I was asked just to briefly provide some background on the lawsuit and then I'll get into Quinault's um, position on these issues. So briefly, as was mentioned, uh, FDA approved genetically engineered salmon late uh, 2015, we, Quinault, as well as many others, uh, were deeply alarmed when that public announcement was made and we immediately uh, got into litigation mode. And so uh, shortly after that approval, uh, a lawsuit was filed. There were 12 basic claims and there were three three theories, really. Um, the first was that the FDA acted outside the scope of their authority. Uh, as was pointed out, uh, genetically engineered salmon were treated as an animal drug. By doing that, they were relying on other data and other science that wasn't consistent. So the first claim is they acted outside the scope of their authority and, and illegally. The second basis was they utilized what was called a, a, it was a 2009 guidance document. Now in my first year of law school, we learned this thing called rock, scissors, and paper, uh, how laws are applied. You have treaties and constitutions, then you have statutes, then you have regulations, then you have policies. Nowhere on that line do you see a guidance document. <laughs> it has no legal weight, has no legitimacy. So when they utilize a guidance document as a basis to make that decision, uh, that was faulty and illegal in, in our opinion. The third and final uh, basis uh, that we, the theory that we advanced was they didn't consider NEPA, they didn't consider other environmental laws. So that in and of itself uh, was uh, something that we challenged because we have a treaty protected resource in these federal laws that are designed to protect our salmon and our, our prized sockeye it is, should be considered. So that was the basis of the lawsuit. We were happy to join. Uh, Quinault uh, acted very aggressively. We have a long history of suing the United States uh, and we're, we're very successful at that. Uh, as was pointed out, I think we're now 13 and 0 uh, on, on treaty uh, claims. And uh, last year we met with Governor Inslee and I, I, I said, please do not ever put us in this position ever again of having to defend our treaty. Let's rise above treaty conflicts. Let's occupy a position of political equality and let's treat each other as, you know, uh, with respect and with good faith and, and to do those things that we all want to strive for. And that's creating a healthy, brighter future for our children and future generations. Now, I want to just 
pivot from the litigation and the lawsuit to why Quinault got involved in this um, particular issue. We are dealing with climate change to a degree that uh, has, has reached us uh, deeply, passionately for over, well over a decade. Uh, I've been challenged as a tribal leader uh, with two villages where the sea level is rising. We're having to relocate two main villages to higher ground because of ocean encroachment. I took a helicopter flight over the Anderson Glacier that feeds the Quinault River. It disappeared. We were expecting to come over the ridge of the Olympic Mountains and see a beautiful uh, blue, pristine glacier. It was gone. It was just dirt. There was no glacier. Uh, the White Glacier is another glacier that's feeding the Quinault. It has receded quite rapidly, and there are only two others remaining. So the idea of a glacier that feeds the mighty Quinault River disappearing is, is I mean, how, how do you wrap your mind around that as, a, as an elected leader to, to deal with it? I asked our scientists what the solution is. They said, the next ice age. Uh, <laughs> to wait for those glaciers to come back. And so we understood that trying to combat climate change was something where these macro environmental issues that are occurring, whether it's ocean acidification, the ocean rising, glaciers melting, there's very little that we can do on those things. So those few public policy decisions for which we do have control over, we better be mindful, we better be conservative, we better uh, do the best we can to protect that resource. And it's not only for our survival, but as we see throughout these presentations, it's the salmon. And Billy Frank, my mentor, my hero, taught us that the salmon cannot get out of the rivers and, and walk through the halls of Congress. They cannot get out of the rivers and argue cases before the Supreme Court. We have that sacred responsibility and duty to be the advocate for this prized, precious resource that we all in the Pacific Northwest view as iconic. We all enjoy a good salmon bake, right? We want to have our children, our grandchildren to know what that's like. I, it's unconscionable for me to even think of trying to explain to future generations of Quinaults what prize blueback looked like, what it tasted like. So when we undertook this climate fight, I found out that in the 1950s and 60s, we had millions of sockeye returning to the upper Quinault, millions of these beautiful salmon. And the year I got elected, we only had 4,000. And last year, we only harvested 27. And we had to close our blueback fishery this, this last season. That is how imperiled this prized resource is. So you might have heard of this initiative last year called 1631. Uh, Quinault was part of negotiating some of the provisions to hold the fossil fuel industry accountable for those. We are also part of a lawsuit in, in looking at uh, suing the pharmaceutical companies for the opioid crisis. Many of the, the killings, and, and I've been to a lot of funerals, not only at Quinault, but throughout Indian country and throughout our region where we, we see early death, we see elders dying from prescription pills, uh, and now we've got this lawsuit. And there's one common theme through all these lawsuits, and that is money. Whether it's big pharma, big oil, or these industries, they're not looking at the health of our people. They could care less. They just want that profit and that dollar. And that means if salmon, disappear, and we have these frankenfish in our oceans, if our children are dying, if our oceans are becoming acidic, and, and there's a point where we start to feel helpless, right? I, I mean, I have to resist that temptation of feeling apathetic, of turning on the news and not being frustrated to the point where I just want to watch reruns of Days of Our Lives or, you know, some other thing to escape. I told my mom, I said, soap operas now are seemingly more interesting than turning on the news. Uh, there's more drama on the, the news. And so what can we do? And I just want to implore you tonight, as you listen to all these presentations, understand and recognize the power of this country is not in some oval office of a person sitting on Pennsylvania Avenue, some person. It's not Wall Street. I mean, there, there's some that question, do we even live in a democratic system anymore? when the Supreme Court has ruled in Citizens United that corporations are people, and there can be unlimited spending to, to shift the balance of power in our, in our democracy. I tend to think that those hours where we are challenged as a country, our finest hours have come when people have resisted becoming apathetic, resisted becoming negative in the face of global and epic proportionate crises 
which we're all facing today. Our generation is facing these challenges. But the power is not in those other sources. This country was based on the idea that the average citizen and our collective voice is more powerful than any other force. So I want to implore you tonight that we truly are the last line of defense in this system. And I've seen it throughout Indian country, whether it's Quinault fighting crude oil exports, whether it's the Lummi at Cherry Point, whether it's anywhere in Standing Rock, uh, the average citizen is starting to understand our treaties truly are the last line of defense against corporate exploitation, against greed, against putting our planet entirely imperiled. And so I really am, am happy, I'm grateful for the opportunity to come to events like this because we are the last line of defense and together we can shape, there's a saying that you can't predict the future, but you can help shape it. And I truly believe that our finest hour is near, that we have to survive as a people, that we have to honor the teachings of our elders and truly be the advocate for the salmon that cannot get out of the river. We are that last line of defense. And so I just want to say siakwil, that's thank you in Quinault. I'm honored, I'm willing to engage. We are willing to engage with anyone, anytime, any place to protect our salmon, to hold corporations accountable, and to make a future that uh, we could all be proud of. We want to honor our ancestors and honor those future generations yet to be born. Siakwil. You've learned tonight, or you knew perhaps, but there's several fronts um, in this ongoing struggle. The lawsuit, which hopefully will reverse the FDA's approval of GE Salmon, um, and, and others, but there's specifically some things that you can do. And so um, right now I just want to ask you to personally be engaged in this issue. So we have three asks. Um, the first one is to help raise awareness. Um, you can share our film. It's, you know, less than four minutes. It was produced in order to be a useful tool for, for sharing via social media, for showing in classrooms, for, sh you know, share it with your family, share it with a friend, do what you can to, to get the film out there. It lives on our website at cagg.org slash stem and people. Um, we also want you to ask your senators to co-sign the labeling bill that was introduced by um, Senator Murkowski and that has always been co-signed co-sponsored by our Senator um, Maria Cantwell, but Senator Murray has not um, co-sponsored that bill at this point. So if you're from Washington State, we're asking you to call Senator Murray. Um, if you're from another state, call both of your senators. Um, and Dana is gonna share a little bit more background about the bill. Um, yeah, so the, the GMO labeling bill, ultimately, it's very simple. It demands that the genetically engineered salmon be labeled as genetically engineered or GMO using on-package labeling as opposed to what the current bioengineered standard says, which is that you can call it bioengineered, a term that most people don't understand is linked to genetic engineering. And you'd have to actually label it using words on the salmon as opposed on the package, as opposed to hiding behind a QR code or a 1-800 number, which really discriminates against people who, one, don't have smartphones, two, might not be in regions where there's internet, three, there might not be phone service, four, that takes a long time. It just is really discriminatory against people. Um, so this labeling bill would do as it says. It would label the GMO salmon as genetically engineered or GMO. And this bill has the chance of undermining the USDA regulations and, and setting specific, yeah. I mean, and that's, that's true. It is also a precedent set, uh, setting bill right now, which is um, to say, no, actually people want to know that it's genetically engineered. People have said that they want it labeled as GMO and genetically engineered. And so really the USDA's um, bioengineering standard goes against what people have very clearly said they want, including some of the major companies, including like the G General Mills and other major companies that want to actually label the foods as their consumers are demanding, but now there's this confusing law that says they don't have to. Um, so it, it, is, it is indeed a precedent-setting precedent um, piece of legislation that, that is not only critical for genetically engineered salmon, 
also all of the, the animals that are in the pipeline, the GE pig and other fish, chickens, cows, as well as uh, the plants in our food system. Thank you, Dana. Um, so it's important to, to write your own personal letter to your senator if you can, to, to give their office a call, ask to meet with them, but you also can just um, easily take action on this by following the link that's up here, the foe.org. Thanks to Friends of the Earth, they um, have you know, a quick and easy way to contact your senators um, through an action alert on their website. So you could actually just open that up right now and take action. You gonna do it? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, all right. And then finally, we're working on a new target for this campaign. Um, now that you know, there's a possibility of um, this GMO salmon being produced for the first time in the US, um, we are um, in conversation with um, different organizations um, to see if there are food service companies that would be appropriate to pressure to not um, buy and distribute um, GMO salmon. So we're looking at Compass and RMR as possible targets. But um, so we haven't we haven't decided yet. But we just want to ask you to pledge tonight um, your support to this and join future campaigns um, to pressure food service companies to not purchase GE salmon. And you can stay updated. Um, we will contact you if you register tonight to ask you to do that. Um, and you should be seeing new action alerts um, coming forth with other ways to take action soon. Um, do you want to add anything about that, Dana? Just to say, you know, it's great that, that a lot of retailers have said they're not going to sell it on their shelves. However, um, food service companies are the providers for all of our schools and for colleges and our hospitals and, you know, hotels and airplanes. Um, and so really it's, it's, it's important that we are, are, are asking the major companies in this country, don't, don't push this GMO salmon onto the plates of our children and, and into hospitals um, and, and elsewhere. And so that, that is indeed the next front line of, of companies who will be hearing from the public. So like I said, we'll follow up with folks um, with, with these asks, but you can also take a picture of the slide or there's also, um, they're written up there with a script and how to call, contact your senators. Those, that's what those poster papers are, are up there. So we're trying to make it really easy for you to, to take action. And you're going to take action, right? We're going to stop this. Right on. OK. And I know a lot of you already have. So um, like I said, if you want to ask a question, please come down to the mics, as you have. Um, if there's anyone who has access issues and you would like us to bring you a mic, you can just raise your hand, and we will do that. Um, one last thing. Simon, have you already distributed the cards? Okay, great. So we gave it out the cards to make sure that you can tell your friends about the film as well. Um, so I will facilitate the, the Q&A and we can start here. Yeah, on the FDA website, it lists you know, mercury in all the fish, so at, at varying levels. So I was just wondering, I, I mean, is there actually any place you can actually find fish without mercury in it? I don't know. I don't know if there's any place you could go uh, okay. to. Uh, right. Uh, okay. And, and then, and then lastly, uh, just comparing like farm farm raised salmon with wild salmon. I've heard negative things about farm raised. Could you just say something about that if you know anything about about that part? About farm raised. Yeah, well, but being not as good as wild because of other, whatever. So, yeah. I, I'm not answering. You don't. You don't know. Okay. Because, I mean, anyway, okay. So just, if, if, you so, don't, if you don't know, that's okay. Are, are you asking just, so, I mean, the, the difference between the two? Well, well, no, I've heard, like, you know, there's a lot of problems with farm-raised salmon yes. compared to wild salmon, and I, I don't know if you could elaborate on the problems with farm-raised versus I, wild I think the slides that we had earlier um, best exemplify the, the differences. Uh, the one that showed, uh, when you look at wild salmon, it's rich in fatties. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, a lot of nutrients, there's vitamins, but the genetically engineered salmon uh, have very little nutritional value. There's very few vitamins. Um, they're okay. cancerous. Uh, they're proven to, uh, you know, through research, they're, they're hazardous. 
And that's one of the things that we're really challenging, the, the idea that genetically engineered salmon is fit for human consumption, we disagree with fundamentally. We think it's unsafe, it's not healthy, and so for all those reasons, uh, but when, when you take something like a wild salmon, it, it's full of nutrients, it's full okay. of healthy, uh, I mean, scientists have, I mean, there's re research after research that you know, explains uh, the omega-3 complex and all of the different values to, to salmon. I mean, lean, healthy diets, I mean, it's, so there's, there's very much a, a big difference uh, between the two, and from our perspective, uh, when you look at the, the, the risks and the threats of genetically engineered salmon, it's just, it's just not healthy, it's not fit for human consumption. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, though, I, I don't know whether or not this was the essence of your question, but there is a discussion in the field about hatchery fish versus wild fish versus farm fish, et cetera. Some of those names are somewhat deceiving because you don't really know what they mean. Um, hatchery fish have been held by the courts to be uh, uh, compensation to tribes for the loss of salmon they've suffered through the loss of habitat. And at one time, the state didn't want the tribes to be able to take hatchery fish. In the old days, even older than me, and that's old days, uh, hatcheries were sometimes not as well conceived as they should be. And over the years, that has changed. I know that many tribes uh, and the state of Washington have hatchery programs. Part of that is because of the habitat being in such bad state. Uh, if we could return the habitat, if we could, re oh, I thought we, I'm going to die here. If we, I was that bad. If we could return the habitat to a state of productivity, I don't think anybody will want to see any kind of hatchery fish program. But until that happens, in order to sustain the treaty right, to sustain the, the fishery, uh, people, not me, the scientists, are looking for ways to make sure those hatchery fish are not causing problems to the habitat or to the other fishery. If that was what you're talking about, is a like um, in school we were taught that the if it's ever labeled as farm raised it's typically Atlantic almost I mean it has to be right and then if if it, it'll have something to brag about like wild fish wild salmon you'll see that um, and when it's farm raised it's an Atlantic salmon and it's also been fed things that salmon don't eat like sawdust and corn and so their flesh comes out gray colored and to remedy that, they put a lot of antibiotics in the water and they dye the sawdust pink so that it will show up in the flesh. Like there's a lot of, even that is really gross. So, so um, and then to your question about mercury, you know, we get that a lot in Indian country that, oh, our foods are toxic. And I have, a, a, unfortunately, a lot of work to undo with my, um, my relatives that, you know, our foods may seem toxic because they are more regulated and tested by the EPA, but if you look at the alternative, like we aren't testing the mercury levels or pesticide levels in hot dogs and hamburgers and whatever that clown is feeding our kids, you know? So you gotta kind of offset the, the belief that there's this really toxic food in nature because nature's, um, because of all the pollutants in nature. And of course we have to clean those things up, but we really shouldn't be afraid of it. So I hope that helps. Yes, my name is Frank Kroger. I'm a retired longshoreman. I was a longshoreman here at Local 19 for 19 years, no, 16 years. And only one time did I ever see a local fisherman come and clear the nets of, of the salmon, which I'm sorry, I didn't see it more often. Uh, my question is, the, the film said about them being grown in Panama. My question is, are they, are they is that in an ocean environment or a, a totally enclosed environment with no connection to the ocean? And, um, and what, so if there's any connection between the orcas and the salmon, I would like to know about that too. I can answer the part about the Panama. Uh, no, the facilities are not completely landlocked. They're next to major waterways, like a large river um, that does in fact connect to the ocean. And, and some of the major problems with that facility is that there has been 
um, escape already. And, and that's where they're um, not growing the salmon, but just growing the eggs. So it's growing the salmon, but, but in the egg stage. Um, and, there, and there has been documentation already of the escape of those eggs uh, in response to some of the natural disasters, storms, floods, et cetera. So uh, are they eventually gonna be grown here? Is that the, the big plan of the industry? This sounds like a first step, and eventually they'll be grow growing them here. Is that in the U.S.? Yes. Uh, I was going to speak to the, the orca issue, and then I'll uh, come back to that. Uh, you know, Chief Seattle had a, a quote that all things are connected. What we do to the earth, we do to ourselves. And, uh, I mean, the belief that we have is everything has a purpose. Everything has uh, a meaning and a value. And the salmon connection to the orca... Is, is one that, I mean, just like we rely on, on fish and for our identity, for our diet, for uh, our ceremonies, there's a special relationship and connection between the salmon of this region and uh, the orca. And, you know, from our perspective, when we saw the orca this last summer uh, for weeks carrying a, a dead calf, that was a sign, that was a that was a, 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 an alert, an alarm, call to action that we need to uh, pay attention to what's happening. And so we're seeing higher rates of mortality. We're seeing the, you know, the populations dwindle to a point of uh, you know, a declaration of emergency. And so Chief Seattle's words are timeless. They, were, they had meaning back then and they have uh, you know, meaning now. And it's our belief that these are not only timeless values that uh, we hold as foundational to our belief systems and our principles, but they are proven through the centuries. And so many of the values that we hold uh, transcend national borders. They're fundamental principles. And when you talk to indigenous peoples, whether here in the United States or in other parts of the world, you're going to find that same belief system of uh, all things being connected, that everything has a purpose, everything has a meaning. And so when you start to see the decline of our salmon, you're going to see, uh, and I personally believe that what we're witnessing in this generation is just the tip of the iceberg. I would hate to think of the collapse of entire ecosystems in our region, not only to animal life, but plant life. And, uh, you know, there was this idea that native people were primitive upon European contact. Well, if you look at, you know, people like Abraham Maslow and uh, Stephen Covey, you know, the hierarchy of maturity at the very base is selfish people. And, and I was, you know, suffice to say that those are corporations. <laughs> they kind of just uh, exist to preserve their own identity regardless. And then you move into independence and then interdependence. Well, Native people, we had an interdependence not only relative to our fellow humanity, but we had an interdependence relative to the natural world, relative to animals. We had ceremonies relative to our creator, the spiritual dimension. And so the question that you ask, the connection between between the orca and the salmon, it's a very sacred relationship. It's sacred in terms of the salmon to the orca, but it's also all of us. We are all connected. We all have a duty to um, respect that relationship, appreciate that relationship, and, and protect that relationship. Um, in response to the question about the facilities in the U.S., there is a facility that's been approved as a drug facility um, in Indiana, and that is where the eggs will be shipped to um, to then grow the the salmon. Um, they will likely the eggs will likely actually be shipped, I believe, from Prince Edward Island in Canada because of all the problems with the facilities in Panama. Uh, so there is an approved facility to grow the eggs. In, in Canada on Prince Edward Island on the on the eastern side, um, and and those will those will be um, raised in Indiana. There is a concern in Indiana because the brown trout is um, is is the wild fish there through all of the rivers, and there is uh, a number of scientific studies showing that the brown trout and the the salmon the the GE salmon can breed. Um, and so that, that, that is indeed an environmental threat, regardless of the fact that it's not on the coast. I, I have uh, two questions, sort of factual questions. Uh, uh, one is, what is a pout fish? Have I ever seen one before? And is that, if that was even one of the three? And then the other is, uh, 
if I want to have nightmares about frankenfish, should I be thinking of fish in fish pens like we had in Puget Sound, or would these fish eventually start migrating up rivers? Uh, I don't know if it's too early to answer that, but that's my two questions. We don't know. Uh, there's always a risk if you put a, a fish in a place where it can escape that it might. We had that large escaping of salmon up in Canada, which, and we have, uh, when we, no, they have been found, I didn't find them. They have been found uh, down southern Puget Sound. So these fish did, did migrate. I don't know how many numbers or anything like that, but if you allow that process to escalate, then you have every, everything you have that goes wrong also escalates. Yeah. And instead of having one, you have 100, then you have 1,000, et cetera. Um, the inbreeding is, I think, one of the issues that has been a strong issue uh, in the whole genetically modified salmon arena. I guess I would add to the point that uh, when we had the escape here in uh, the Salish Sea, uh, the company president came out to talk and, and meet with tribes, and the one thing that was quite apparent to, to us and something that we put on the table is a lot of the science that uh, looks at the risks and whether they can interbreed and all. You have to be careful. Who paid for that research? Who paid for that science? And, and so once again, uh, you know, these things should be based on objective. Tribes are, are known, we're notorious for letting science drive our decisions. Uh, I am in my fifth term. I've never run a campaign. I've never accepted one penny of political contributions, and so we, we operate in a unique environment within tribal nations where we're not uh, beholden to special interests, and we could just advocate good public policy. We could let pure science drive our decisions, and that's why tribes are able to advocate so effectively, but when you're looking at uh, evidence that's uh, introduced and, and, and that science is paid for, it's bought and sold and predetermined and uh, designed to fit the, the arguments in the case. and the, So just be careful on uh, reading science. That uh, Always look to question, is it objective? Is it best science? And is it free from all of those other influences? And what's a pout fish? That was one of the three I, items. It's like an eel, an eel-like fish. And just as, you know, to be clear, so right now they're being... Um, raised to full maturity in landlocked takes in Panama, right? Yeah, right? But there's nothing saying, just like what we did to mobilize in opposing getting that resolution done before this was passed, there's nothing that's stopping it from coming into Washington state waters. And so, you know, an, an honest next step is to look at banning GE fish from Washington waters right. altogether so that in the future that kind of um, that kind of opportunity can exist. So. Does anyone have a question? That, oh, wait, um, one second. I just want to see if there, if you want to raise your hand if you'd like us to bring you a mic. Okay. So I just want to play a bit of devil's advocate here. So the salmon stock is depleting significantly, and I guess supporters of GMO salmon could say that if this is done well, it would be a way to help save our wild stock if people eat that instead of wild stock. So I'm just curious what your thoughts are, you know, if we were instead to work with the company to do it properly, which never works out that way in the long run, but if, you know, that was what the advocacy was around instead to keep it in landlock areas, make sure it doesn't um, mate with the brown trout you know, thoughts on that. And then along those same lines, so there are companies that are starting to grow meat and fish in labs. So salmon is one of the products that's being worked on. And again, that goes towards if we can grow salmon in labs, we stop bleeding the wild stock. So curious to hear your thoughts on that as well. I feel like if that were the intentions, then this whole process would have looked a lot different. You know, that people would have been, cons tribes would have been consulted in the first place, but, or, or resolutions would have been listened to and there would have been a response. There would have been a collective effort to make that kind of thing happen.
but instead it's just been wielding power time and time and time again and corporations stepping on people. And, you know, like my teacher Alan here has, has said, the treaties are the most powerful environmental legislation of this land. And, um, and it, we should be looked at as allies in, in cleaning it up. And so if the concern is really the stress on the wild stock, then we would have sat down at tables and had more meaningful consultation. Sure, uh, I'll, uh, I'll add to that. Uh, fundamentally, we believe that you know, the creator gifted us with these prized resources. I mean, they're gifts. Uh, and, and as I mentioned in the film, to think that we could somehow improve upon that is pretty arrogant of, of humans to think that uh, in all of the, the, over time, when you look at the possibility of, you know, what's gonna happen to this, this resource, we're at a point in, in history where any factor, any imbalance could, could thrust, you know, these prized stocks to be forever lost, forever gone. And so, as I, I said in my, uh, my remarks, there are so many macro environmental things impacting this resource and adding a stress to it. Uh, why put additional threats to a resource that's already um, near in peril and near extinction? Why even allow circumstances to arise where you would further threaten that resource when you have uh, wild stock that do escape, uh, that you know the food supply is very limited and to put a, a risk where our wild stock would have to compete with other Frankenfish to just survive, that's a significant risk. The other risk is in, in the pens, uh, they, you know, their waste has to go someplace and the waste further pollutes the water. So there are so many risk factors to a species that's already extremely vulnerable. Uh, that's something that simply, we, I, mean, I can't see any circumstance under which that's something that we would want to willingly do and willingly do in a fashion where we think we could somehow improve upon an animal, uh, a, a resource that uh, is from our perspective, perfection. You just can't do that. And it's fundamentally and morally wrong. It puts this, uh, this resource at risk. So that's our initial reaction. I mean, those are things that uh, in public, public life, you have to make uh, political decisions. You have to make moral decisions. But ultimately, it's those, those timeless values that if you're willing to surrender and compromise on those basic fundamental values, uh, that's, just, that's just the first domino. You start to see domino after domino after domino fall. And we have a sacred duty to ensure that that very first and last domino stands under all circumstances because it's, it's our life, it's the life of those species and the entire, uh, you know, the entire ecosystem and all of humanity that becomes a, a risk if, if that one domino falls. So, uh, no, <laughs> I guess that's my way of saying no. <laughs> Um, I, I want to add a, a footnote to that. First of all, I appreciate the question. So, you know, it, it's a contrary question, that, but it's a good question that needs to be answered and addressed. If Billy Frank were here, uh, he would look at Fawn and say, okay, Fawn, you're almost right. But what you say is, it's the habitat, damn it. It's the habitat. And you can do two things to save ourselves and our children from having no food. One is we can create food in a test tube and we can hope that it's okay. Or we can go out to the habitat which has produced foot, food forever, protect that habitat so fish, fish and other uh, resources as well are available forever. And I think from the tribal point of view, they would answer that question as saying, it's habitat, damn it. Let's fix that. And then we can talk about making food in a test tube. And I think these two things should always go hand in hand, right? It's not just stop the GE salmon, it's protect the habitat at the same time. Because well, that, that's, that's a good point. You can do two things at once. But I think historically, the, we've taken the, the path of least resistance. And the least resistance is the corporation, I mean, not, not corporation, the place where we can make it. The hardest place to go is the habitat which is being which is being affected by us, we have to change our behavior, we have to figure out how we go out there, where are we picnic, whether we're going to put te uh, plastic in our garbage, or whether we're going to have paper straws versus plastic. I mean, 
things we do to change our lifestyle, to change that habitat, that's hard. And unfortunately, when given the choice that you're for hypothetically posturing, the easy place is to not fix the straws, not fix the plastic, but to build something. I mean, I with my daughter, uh, every time I get a six pack of Coke, she grabs the little plastic thing with a pair of scissors and she cuts the damn thing into little shreds. Because she tells me, birds can get caught in that piece of plastic. Well, we can do that. And I think that's what tribes would look at. This fix the habitat, this fix our behavior, this make sure it's food for everybody before we start creating new food. One, one second. Um, I'm sorry. No, one, one second. Just, I want to, as a coastal person who has ancestral ties to this land, thank you so much. Oh. Um, it means a lot that we bring traditional knowledge to science and that we center it in that. And thank you so much. My hands go to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, so I just, it's time to wrap up. So um, I just noticed it's a little past 8.30. So do any of the panelists have any last things that you want to say in response to the questions before I thank some folks? Okay. Well, we want to say that we are so honored, CAGJ, to work with all of you and that we're just so grateful that you came here tonight and, and shared your wisdom. So please join me in thanking these amazing people. So I want to thank you all for taking action to stop GE Salmon and to at least ensure that it's clearly labeled. Um, I want to thank Center for Food Safety and Friends of the Earth who really are leading the way nationally and Earth Justice who's co-counsel on the lawsuit. We want to thank Loki Fish Company who donated wild salmon. They're strong partners, CAJJ, and we love Loki and Central Co-op, and all of our community partners who help publicize, our interns, Jack and Becca, and CAGJ's organizing director, Simone Adler, and most importantly, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.